Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to talk uh, uh, about photography. We're going to go to Palestine, and uh, I'm with uh, Skip Shell, who is a photographer, and joining us to, um, and we're going to do these interviews. And I'm joined by Jack Jill, who is uh, with Presenza with us, and uh, working, and she has been participate to uh, to an exhibition and the work done with the uh, Agape community. And so I'm going to ask Jackie to, to launch us to the discussion and because she had experiences uh, live. So Jackie, welcome and uh, please gi give us an introduction. Okay. Um, on October 1st of this year, I um, attended um, a 40th anniversary of a community in Massachusetts called Agape Community. And it is an intentional community based on nonviolence. And it was a day long affair. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, um, but I found a very heartwarming uh, event, I'll call it an event, that kind of crisscrossed with many emotions. And one of them was, um, Mr. Scheel, Skip Scheel, who has, um, is a photographer and stunning pictures of people in Palestine. And I don't know the entire story and that's what he's here to discuss, but the pictures were stunning. The, um, the information that, that he gave out was heartwarming and heart wrenching at the same time. Um, there's one thing to to read words. There's another thing to see it in pictures um, or in film. So I was impressed, and I uh, I thought that this would be a good opportunity for him to uh, to speak to the worldwide audience at Presenza and give him his give everyone his take on uh, Palestine. Thank you so much, Jackie. So now, uh, uh, Skip, this is your turn maybe to introduce yourself and then follow up on, on Jackie's introduction. And we have a couple of pictures we can show uh, when, you, when you are interested. Well, as Jackie said, I am a photographer and videographer and writer. I have a website and blog and slideshows, and I'm aiming at a book. And my current second book, first book is about Gaza. Second would be um, called The Ongoing and Relentless Nakba. Nakba is an Arabic word that means catastrophe. And it refers to um, a period uh, going on for about three months, maybe a little longer. In uh, yeah, a year and a half, 1948, when Israel, to form its state, um, uh, violently removed 750,000 Palestinians from what is now Israel. Many of them live in the West Bank of Palestine, the occupied territory of the West Bank. And my project is to locate these people, old, some as old as I am, 81, uh, some dying already, I know of one, no surprise, photograph them, interview them with the help of um, remarkable assistants, Palestinians, uh, who lead me to these people, uh, vouch for my credibility because I can't just walk into a refugee camp and say, hi, I'm looking for refugees to interview and, and translate and help me with the interview generally. And then I learn where their original homelands were um, and uh, usually they cannot go back. There are some cases where they can, but I have American white male privilege and I can cross the border called the Green Line, go into Israel and try to locate these places, which is not always easy because Israel follows a, a policy of erasure, much like the U.S. does with native people. I but find... Sorry, you are telling me that some of the people are still into camp? 
Yes. 50 years later? Yes. Or it's even 70 years later? And they're Correct. still living on the camp? Correct. Okay. Yeah, for the most part, they I, live elsewhere too, sure. within, within the West Bank. Yeah. And so you want me to go on with my... Yeah, uh, yeah, sure, go on, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so um, I locate these sites if I can. Many of them are buried, uh -huh. uh, especially along the coast, uh, which is urbanized very thickly. And I photograph, make landscape photos. And so uh, I have two core sets of photographs, portraits, which um, David can show examples of, and uh, the landscapes, uh, which are their original homelands. When I um, later, I will add photographs of the original sites before the Nakba, that is 1947 and earlier, showing village life as it was then. And also uh, the fourth component would be um, uh, the dislocation process, the Israeli army coming in and uh, removing people and often destroying their homes. So what David is showing you now is part of the series. These folks are um, from various camps, like this is in Janine in the West Bank, a son and a grandson of that man. Of the man who was before? Yeah, the older man. Of him. I concentrate on hands and feet and um, the environment that they live in now uh, to try to fill, fill, fill out the view of these people, human beings. I call them survivors. This is all from my web, from my blog, um, skipshield.wordpress.com. And while a partner like Farid or Musa are interviewing people or translating, I'm trying to pay attention to the interview, but also it gives me some latitude to photograph. And so if I had to do solo interview with solo camera work, it'd be very complicated. I, do, I, just, I just don't have the skill to do that. So having somebody with me doing much of the interviewing helps me a lot. Uh, Andrew, living in um, Haifa, uh, is a second generation Nakba survivor, spoke fluent English, ran a guest house, which is how I met him. And so I could talk with him without the aid of a translator. And of course, I watch for expressions. And um, uh, luckily, I, I never feel hurried with people. I think they are. They feel honored that I'm there. Not that I'm the first one to come in because these stories have circulated a lot. Never in photographic form, as far as I have been able to learn. And so I, I, I work a combination of questions and um, photographing to wait for and show good moments in their expressions. Um, some of them are posed in the sense that, you know, have people look at the camera, but generally speaking, they're talking while I photograph. And uh, you have more uh, photo into your, um, into your blog. I mean, I don't know if you, you want me to show some of them or. Um, yeah, it might be good. The landscapes that are their destroyed sites. Yeah. Can you find those that should be on the same page? Sure. Yeah, right here. I'm glad you're, yeah, there. Uh, it's a destroyed mosque in a village called Al-Kabu, which is now a national park renamed with a hero of the independence movement who happened to be, I think, a war criminal. And others have uh, alleged that as well. Massacres and the like. A cistern. And some of these sites are touristic in the sense that uh, Israel has maintained them and it, it leads people, both um, internal like uh, Israelis, but also foreign visitors to these these sites. Remember, this is these are national parks, many of them. 
this particular series is not that that large building which probably dates back uh, two or three hundred years yeah and of course palestinians have lived there mixed with uh what has been called hebrews or israelites original jewish people for millennia which complicates the whole story there are two peoples in one land a crusader castle and the arab village was right next to it and i talked with somebody who lived there during that period and there were um as i recall there were monks christian monks still using that castle or church which dated back to around 1200. wow so archaeologically there's you know great great interest in this area um and uh i am a um a, I'm very interested in archaeology, so an amateur archaeologist. And that's one of the reasons I like going back there, because unlike the U.S., maybe more like France, if that's where David's from, yeah. or um, you know, yeah. Western in Europe. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the buildings really do date back. And the presence of people, not that there weren't people in the U.S. And I'm trying to focus on that, that indigenous people have lived here for uh, something for like 50 time. Yeah. years. Yeah. And we tend to forget that. Uh, this is a, a mosque in a called it's called a mixed town in Israel, and it is still operating as a mass mosque, and it's the site of a massacre of over 250 people. So some of the structures are still used. This is in a, um, a, a, a an Israeli settlement, um, Mevo Betir, Betir, if I have the name right. And it's been, I think, converted. It has Arabic quality. And this is a fairly common case that um, Palesti uh, that Israelis will not only take over a um, former Palestinian area, but if they don't destroy it or bury it, then they might make use of the structures, renovate them. Uh, there's a very well-known place called uh, Ein Hud that is an artist colony now for Israels, for is Israelis. Mm -hmm. And most of the buildings date back to the the Palestinian period. And you have this collection also. Yeah, so this is pre-Nakba life. Uh, agrarian, self-sufficient, often near Jews. And a common story is, yes, we live together, not always harmoniously, but we did live together. We traded together. We sometimes celebrated together. But as soon as the Nakba started, this is an Arab, a, um, an Arab or Palestinian speaking, my, my neighbors turned hostile and they came at us with guns. There are, archi there are archives of these photos, but they're mostly in the hands of Israel. And so it's very difficult to uh, access them. It's one of many challenges for this project. Yeah. There are two mu Palestinian museums in the U.S. One's in Connecticut, and they have a, a vast collection. And I hope to make use of that. And then there should be another set here. Um, no, this yeah, so this is during the process of forced removal, often by foot, carrying everything they owned. Many, a common story again was, we expected to be gone for at most two weeks and come back. Sometimes um, the army would tell them that. Sometimes they just assumed it. They just couldn't believe they were being forced out like this, but they never came back, with some exceptions. In the northern part of Israel, in the Galilee, there are villages where uh, folks have been able to stay or come back. But the people that I interviewed were in the West Bank. They yeah. they can't come back. There's nothing to come back to. Yeah. They often said another common story. I want to be buried there. And I didn't say to them, well, not much chance of that. And even if you were able to get a plot, uh, it could be desecrated. So how how did you? How did you end up in um, in this project? How how did it make because it's in some ways so simple and and it's so powerful, 
then I'm like, how, how did you come up with the ideas at the first place? Because it's really, uh, uh, that's how a story should be made. It, sh it should be uh, uh, that type of connection between um, the places and the experience of people and, and the displace. Um, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's a challenging today because a lot of people are displaced all over the world and, and we, we treat them so badly then this is a historical um, testimony. Well, it's a small part of a big story and it's uh, uh, not well revealed. Um, I began photographing in the region in 2003. I went on a delegation with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. There were about 20 of us with two excellent guides. And we went all over Israel and Palestine and met a variety of groups, including soldiers, uh, Israeli soldiers. So uh, this is in the context of um, nearly 20, uh, 19, 20 years of work there. I've been to Gaza uh, at least six times. I've been to the general area somewhere around 20 times. I, Until the pandemic, I went every year and a half on average. And um, uh, I've worked on a number of different themes, women, youth, uh, resistance, uh, Gaza, and um, uh, it dawned on me, um, 2018, um, I won't go into that story, it's a side story in a way, that I need to attend more to um, refugees. And so um, I was able to start, did some groundwork, that is some research, and then I went, my first trip there on this project was 2018. So 2018, 2019. But um, David and Jackie, there's a very personal component here. I think as all art has somewhere in the artist's psyche, a beginning point. And he or she may not recognize it until working on the project. Yeah. And it was after I started this that I realized one of my major motivations was my own story with displacement. Yeah. I was raised on the south side of Chicago. Black people started moving in. My parents picked up the cues, schools, uh, housing values would plummet. And we were the first white family to flee the South Side, my, my particular neighborhood. This crushed me. I was 14 years old. I became a, well, I had tendencies toward juvenile delinquency already. But I really, as the phrase is, acted out when I... Um, after I was, after we moved to a suburb, a very classy white suburb near Chicago. And it wasn't, I was, I always knew I was upset by that, but I didn't realize until I was working on this Nakba project that, yeah, to a very small extent, minuscule, I share this experience of displacement. I think any of us could look back into our histories and probably find something like that. And so, on this very, very tiny scale, I, I resonate with people who have pushed out of their houses and say, look, it, it didn't work for me. I know what it led to. And it, look, what it, look what's happening to them. Their, their grief, they're torn by grief and their health is affected. Uh, their family lives are affected. Uh, luckily, there's some resistance growing. And I was really impressed with how the younger generations, especially um, second and third, were very well of the, very aware of well very well aware of their um, of their family's history and were radical, really radical. And so, um, you know, that can take different forms. Hopefully there will be a nonviolent movement, a massive nonviolent movement to call for the right of return. I have the right of return. I can go back to the south side of Chicago. Why can't they, when Jews everywhere with certain qualifications, can return with full citizenship and often with benefits. Way oh, they, are, they are more, they can, they are invited to do it. it it's even, you go beyond the possibility, it's even welcome for exactly. you to do, to go back. And so, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and on, on top of it, they are not going back to something they were before because they, they were usually born somewhere else. And uh, so, yeah, that's another, that's another discussion. 
But to your experience with refugees who have been refugees for 50, 60, 70, I mean, that's, that's for me, it, it, it's, it's mind-blowing because uh, we are producing refugees at a light of speed right now by thousand every day. So how does that, and, and my problem with, with what you're describing, it's, it's one is a situation of being, having to be forced to be uh, relocated, but it's also after that, the condition of living are just, are just terrible. And, and the whole, the whole conditions, it's not like you going to be able to integrate a, a community and be able to, to, to drive yourself out of poverty, out of uh, be able to be in a society where you're going to be integrated and become a full full length citizen. But it's it's absolutely the opposite. So that's uh, that's really struggling in your in your description of the situation. Well, you might ask, we might ask, well, why is that? Why can Israel act with so much impunity? Well, the easy answer is um, U.S. support, militarily and politically. It's ongoing, and there are cracks, though. As uh, Leonard Cohen, Cohen sang, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And one of the cracks is Congress, with the squad in particular, and, I, and with uh, Betty McCollum, who has, every year for the past four or five, uh, representative from... Um, Minnesota, I think, introduced bills um, to draw attention to what Israel is doing to Palestinian children and call for that to stop, in particular, to end military aid until that stops, military aid to Israel, of course. And so this is relatively new. Secondly, and this I know is going to be um, of interest maybe to only a few people, um, uh, major religions in the U.S. are focusing attention on this. And so the Unitarian Universalists are, the Presbyterians are. Quakers, which is my tribe, is slow, very slow. But now we have three Quaker organizations, uh, two, two of them based in New England. One of them is um, national, that is putting attention on this, calling for... Um, well, BDS, Boycott, Divest, Sanction, a yeah. very powerful movement. Yeah. And so there, this is part of the crack. Yeah, It's happening. And David, I'm sure, Jack, you might want to ask, because this is fairly often asked of me, well, what gives you hope? And other people who work on seemingly <laughs> impossible tasks. Well, the Palestinian people give me hope. They were, they're resilient. Their word in Arabic is... Samud. It's one of my favorite words. Samud. Phonetically spelled S-U-M-U-D. Stands for steadfast. Most people, Jews have been steadfast. You know, most people that are afflicted, African Americans, Native people in this country, etc., they are still here and they're still calling for their rights. That gives me a lot of hope. So Palestinians are a big part of what gives me hope. Great. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your experience, your photo, your work. Uh, it was really a pleasure to have you in the show. And uh, please come back when, you, uh, when the book is out to the new one. <laughs> and we really want to, <laughs> to see it. And I know what it is to put the book out. It's not easy. Uh, good luck with that. And then uh, um, please come back um, anytime. Thank you so much. And thanks and, to both you, Jackie, for the lead and David for accepting it. Yeah, you're welcome. That was your show face to face. And please keep watching your news on Presenza.com and subscribe to YouTube and Facebook and uh, stay put. Thank you so much.